Congressman Huffman, um, considering your commitment to tackling the climate crisis, I'm very concerned um, that agribusiness interests in your district are being prioritized over the protection of the native tuul elk at Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, there are plans to kill these tuul elk. Considering that animal agriculture is widely acknowledged the number one contributor to the climate crisis, what, why do you favor growing agricultural interests within the seashore, even though the ranches were supposed to be phased out? Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm going to uh, speak to what I think is the thrust of your question. There's a lot of individual assertions in there that we could unpack. Uh, animal agriculture is not the number one contributor to the climate crisis right now. Uh, okay. Uh, it is a contributor, I'll admit that, and uh, we're going to need to address food systems and all of these things. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in doing that. Uh, but there are, a few, there are a lot of facts that would need to be checked uh, that are packaged up in that question. Let me just say this. I think there are people here that care a lot about our Thule elk, Thule elk population in the Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, I uh, am a big fan of the Thule elk. Just this weekend, I had my family out at Pierce Point. We were taking a hike and enjoying the Thule elk as we often do. I really do go and use the Point Reyes National Seashore. I love it, like probably most people in this room. But it's really important to understand that what makes Point Reyes so unique is that it's not like you know, any other park in some ways. There are parks for all purposes. There are parks that are meant to protect battlefields and amazing views and wilderness areas. Uh, Point Reyes is, is this really interesting mix of many things. Some of it is the wilderness areas that are so spectacular, the wildlife, great recreation opportunities in the Point Reyes National Seashore. But one of the things that got the whole thing rolling back in the late 50s and early 1960s to protect this place was to preserve the agricultural heritage of West Marin, these historic ranches and dairies, this pastoral. I, I, these are facts. These are just facts. They're just facts. Um, so look, uh, the way it was conceived by Congress, and I've heard the statement that Congress wanted the ranches out in 20, that's, look folks, you're entitled to your opinion, but not your own facts. That's just not true. I've read the statutes. I've read the legislative reports that went along with these statutes. I've gone pretty deep into this, including the most recent, recent statements of Congress, which have continued. Uh, it, it is not a situation where Congress said you got to be out in 20 years or anything remotely close to that. Congress created a pastoral zone as one part of this unique mosaic that is the Point Reyes National Seashore. Now, we may come to some point in the future where we no longer have animal agriculture, where we decide we no longer want to preserve that part of the story of the Point Reyes National Seashore, but we're not there right now. And the Park Service, I think, is doing a pretty good job of trying to protect our wonderful elk herds, which are growing. Uh, the, the, we're actually embracing a new elk herd. We're embracing a third new elk herd because we've got this wonderful problem that our elk are thriving. It's great. Uh, but we don't have to choose between healthy elk herds and giving longer term permits to the historic ranches and dairies. We can have both, and I think most of my constituents want us to have both. Congressman in the back. Congressman in the back. Yeah. Okay. Congressman over here. Hello, Congress. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Congressman, first for participating in our blessed, messy democracy and taking our questions directly. You bet, you bet. Thank you. Worst form of government in the world except for all the others, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so with that in mind, bear with me, because I know I represent probably 30 people in the audience, so we're going to take another stab at this, please. Okay. Politely, of course, and respectfully. Uh, I spoke with Kenneth Brower, who's in his 70s. He's the son of David Brower, former president, as you know, of the Sierra Club. And I sat and asked him many pointed questions, including were the founders of... He was, uh, his father sat with Kennedy in 1962 before you were born, mm -hmm. just when I was born, and indeed, the original intent was not to have cattle remain in our national park. So my question to you is again, why do you support their yeah. continued existence okay. in the, no, let me finish please. Yeah. It's also very important because also, since I know you believe in climate change, thank goodness, they are the number one source of air pollution, 
water pollution and ocean pollution in and biodiversity loss in our own state park. That's why we're so passionate about it, especially because we believe we can, we can reach you, or at yeah. least reach other people to be educated about this issue. It's not just shooting elk, although that's horrible, but cattle really, if you want to keep them in Marin, West Marin, and dairy and ranching, that's one, that's one matter. But inside a national park, in fact, at low, uh, lower rates, they're being subsidized by taxpayers. So it's just an absurd situation yeah. and a polluting situation. I, I appreciate the chance to try to speak a little more to this. So uh, first of all, look, I, I, uh, I, I know your intentions are good. I know you're concerned about our environment and our public lands. We, we share that concern. But let me, let me try to directly answer the direct parts of, of your question. Uh, I will tell you that there is quite a debate about this proposition that Congress or President Kennedy or anyone else intended for these ranches to go away after a specific period of time. People have done doctoral dissertations on this. I have gone back and read the relevant congressional history. It's, it's just nowhere close to that clear. In fact, there's an awful lot of stuff that would point in the other direction. So we, we really just have to, there is a common set of actual facts here that we should be able to accept while we debate the policy. Uh, and, and I really want to bring us back to that. Yeah, it would, look, we got to be respectful too and just not shout each other down, please. Um, now, uh, in terms of, I, I talked about the uniqueness of this park. Part of this park is about historic preservation, all right? And that's right there in the mission of the park. Uh, these ranches were recently uh, nationally designated as a historic district, which is one of a whole bunch of indications that telling that story of the history of the Point Reyes National Seashore includes the working landscapes that these multi-generational ranches represent. Okay, this is not, I believe it's unfair to characterize them as industrial agricultural polluters. I know these families, uh, it's just not fair, it's not accurate. There's about two dozen of these small family ranching um, activities out there. There is twice as much land in wilderness as there is in the pastoral area that's doing this historic ranching. So a little bit of perspective, a little bit of context, and I think the contribution to local food systems is significant as well. If you talk to anyone in the agricultural community of West Marin, they're very concerned about what happens if you lose those organic, most, almost all organic ranches and dairies. There's a tipping point at which the economy of scale that all of them need to continue to provide us with a local food system collapses. They're very worried about that. And I think local food matters and can be part of our climate strategy as well. If we just say we don't like cows because they're, they're emitters, so we're gonna pick on these two dozen historic ranches, we're gonna drive them out of existence, I don't know anybody in this room that's going to stop eating beef or dairy products. Probably what happens, you're probably already not eating them, my friend, okay? Uh, if you're a vegan and you've done that, hats off to you. That's great. But I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back and claim that we've uh, implemented a climate solution if you simply drive that demand off to CAFOs in Kern County, which really are industrial polluters, okay? So, um, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a good conversation. It is intended, you know, in a good-hearted way. I thank you for that. Uh, but let me just close by saying, I'm not going to decide this issue, folks. So you can come and holler at me at my town halls if you want. The Park Service is going to decide this. There's been a very transparent public process. I'm pretty sure all of you have engaged in that and, and uh, have made your views known. They will now take that input and come up with a preferred alternative. Some of you will probably sue to challenge it in court, and on we go. But uh, this won't be my decision about how to strike the balance between continuing these family ranches and dairies and celebrating our thriving elk herds. Okay, thanks. Okay, right here. Okay, right here. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Cheryl. I was born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area, and I love wildlife, I love the outdoors, mm -hmm. I love our national parks. Um, we are so lucky to have Point Reyes National Seashore so close, GGNRA, uh, so close that we could get there in an hour. Um, I was really dismayed to see um, how the 
seashore has degraded with the cattle on the land. Um, I didn't realize there were 5,000 cattle and only 600 um, tule elk. Um, you want to ask me something that hasn't been asked about that? I'm happy to speak to it, yeah, but we probably I, shouldn't keep having the same conversation over and uh, over. I haven't said anything exactly what everybody else says. I, okay. I think we're having a discussion about this, if that's okay, okay with you. No, please. Because I still please. am within I'm, my minute. Yeah. Um, but I hear you. You're not the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. You, The National Park Service is going to do what they want to do, but we're assuming you have some impact. Um, this community has elected you to try to represent us. Um, apparently the National Park Service did do a survey asking us what we wanted and we said we wanted to preserve wildlife and the land. Okay. And um, there's also not been an environmental impact study of how those cattle are degrading the land. Um, why is not that not being taken into account? Um, apparently the levels of E. coli have gone up in the water from pollution from the cattle. And if the cattle need to remain there for historic okay. reasons, why can't they be scaled can I, back? Can I, uh, why are the Thule elk targeted so the, for being the killed? Part of your, the part of your comment that I don't think I've spoken to yet that I'll ha happily address is the, the environmental study uh, on impacts. Uh, now there is a comprehensive environmental review process the Park Service is in the middle of. It will look at some of these things, but the reason they're not starting over, uh, like from a baseline of no action versus cattle, is we've had cattle for like coming up on 200 years. So this is not a new federal action or a federal program, and that's just the way environmental laws work. Uh, so you won't see that sort of nothing versus the status quo, uh, I, I don't think, uh, in this review. And, and let me just clarify, whatever differences we might have on some people wanting to if, get the ranchers out of the park, me wanting to give them a longer term permit. I want to be clear, uh, nobody gets a shortcut on the environment. I want to hold all of them uh, as they continue their operations to very, very high environmental standards. So I, I probably should have clarified that earlier. No shortcuts under any environmental law, no lowering of our environmental standards. We need to maintain really high standards. Congressman, in the back. Mm -hmm. In the back. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say, I feel that if we had a real democracy in this country, we'd be talking about President Clinton and not President Trump. I just want to know, what are you doing about the Electoral College? What's happening in Washington to eliminate what I feel is a really undemocratic process? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, I, I get this Electoral College question everywhere I go, uh, and it's a good question. Um, obviously, the Electoral College is this anachronism that uh, was created a long time ago in a country that was very different for reasons that are very different. It, it is one of those mechanisms in our Constitution that is actually counter-democratic as opposed to democratic. Uh, and it's there for some interesting historic reasons. But uh, the, the bottom line on this question, as much as it frustrates us because California would like to see a national popular vote, our, vo our state votes with the national popular vote, so it feels very unfair and unjust when uh, a minority of states and a minority of the national uh, community can pick the winner in a presidential race. Uh, those are probably going to be the rules, as much as we don't like them for the foreseeable future, because you need a constitutional amendment to change it. Now, there, there are, there's a workaround that some people are advocating, and I've actually supported it, where states would pledge their electors to follow the national popular vote. And the state of California has done that. And if you get to 270 states that are part of that compact, it can behave like a national popular vote it, using the Electoral College mechanism. Here's the problem with that. That works great as long as your state is in sync with the national popular vote. But imagine once uh, that California votes one way and the rest of the country votes another, how are you going to feel? Uh, and our electors are pledged opposite of how we vote. We're going to want out of that deal right away, and it is going to crumble. So it's not a durable long-term fix to this problem. The only real durable ultimate fix is a constitutional amendment. And we just got to be honest. Right now, the politics aren't there to amend the Constitution and change it. We're just going to have to go forward with these rotten rules and win elections anyway. Okay, right here, and we're down to our last question, Congressman. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jan Lotion. I've grown up in the Bay Area. 
I was not looking forward to listening to the impeachment trial because I, at this point, every time one of these Republicans opens their mouth, I feel sick to my stomach and get very depressed and very angry. But what I've experienced so far has made me feel differently. I feel profound gratitude for all of the Democrats that are working that hard to keep democracy alive. Thank you. I've been yeah. very... <laughs> There's a dog that started barking back there when you said that, so we all agree with you. And <laughs> I, I've been particularly moved by Adam Schiff. Yeah, he's great. He's just amazing. <laughs> and I think we all have to remember just how hard all of these people are working yeah. for us and to kind of keep the faith that there yeah. are good people in our country who good. care about democracy. And then since, I, am I at the end here? Okay. You're the cleanup hitter. I yeah. have been telling people who, you know, like to complain about how awful things are and like to wring their hands but aren't doing a damn thing and that it's all sort of like hopeless. And I, my new motto is, I'd rather be an optimist that we are gonna win and be proven wrong than be a pessimist and be confirmed. Mm, I like it, I like it, yeah. So well, thank I, you. I do think that if we all really pledge that we're gonna do something, whether it's postcarding or driving to Tracy or flying to Arizona or donating money to Amy, um, McGrath, that if we all do something, it's going to add up, just like it did in 2018. That didn't happen by magic. It was all these groups from Indivisible and Swing Left and all these thousands upon thousands of people were out there doing it. We can do it again. Well, thank you for that. That's a... I think uh, ending on that note, a call to active citizenship is a great way to wrap up a conversation that is really what our democracy is all about. A chance for me as your member of Congress to visit with my constituents and just have a great, far-ranging, civil, respectful conversation. This is, a, this is good politics here. Uh, let me also thank you for calling out my colleague Adam Schiff and our Democratic House managers. Um, I have, uh, in, in a prior life, I did some work as a trial lawyer I know how hard you work to prepare for that day of trial and that opening statement. And these folks did three consecutive days of opening statements, which, which were effectively kind of the trial. I mean, hopefully we'll get witnesses and documents, but uh, they, were the, they were the main part probably of what this trial will be. And it's, it was clear that they just put an enormous amount of work into this. Uh, they put their heart and soul on the line. And I think that that uh, passion and that authenticity really came through, hopefully for the American people, maybe even for some of those cold, shriveled hearts in the, in the Republican Senate. You never know. Uh, so look, uh, I will just close by saying for everybody that finds themselves you know, subject to uh, bouts of despair, you know, these, are, these are tough times. I ride that roller coaster right there along with you. Um, despair is just not very effective. It doesn't get much done. Uh, and I think a better approach is to draw that inspiration wherever we can find it. I hope Adam Schiff inspired all of you. He certainly did me. You guys inspire me to keep going, and maybe some of my efforts will um, bounce back uh, by way of inspiration to you. But we can create our own hope, and I think we can make a difference as active citizens. It's been great talking with you today. Hey, Rita. How are you?